Sorry. Take the curtain. <laughs> Hi folks. Hi. Thanks for coming. see it, they need to be accountable. We need to have transparency within our government. Like so many Americans before us, we must recognize that freedom must be taught to each generation. And this is our moment to teach this lesson to our children, which is why I brought mine. This is a family affair. We've all been deeply affected by this shutdown, have we not? So we'll continue to raise our voices together so that this government of the people, by the people, and for the people will not perish. So with that, I would like to introduce, yes, I would like to introduce Tom Bryant. He's a small business owner and a friend, and he's going to say a few words uh, about how this has impacted him, his business, and why he's here tonight. Today, Dr. Tom. All right, Tom. I'm a uh, small business owner. I've had a marketing company for the last uh, 19 years, self-employed. Um, I deal with, with hundreds of small businesses through uh, social media marketing, print advertising. I do a lot of uh, consulting. And uh, March 16th, um, 47% of my business went away. With an executive order of a non elected uh, bureaucrat appointed by Mike DeWine. Um, you look around the square of Medina, or whatever, whatever little town in this county you're from, you'll see business after business after business shut down. And uh, three weeks ago, a report came out and uh, I think it was through uh, MSN.com that said 20% of these small businesses will never reopen. Um, Wednesday, um, Forbes.com upped that number to 40%. So 40% of all these businesses, potentially around this square alone, will never be back. Those employees will have to find new work, but well, where are they going to find that work? All because of an overreach by our governor and these bureaucrats who won't release the real data to us. Um, and that's the problem. Um, I like to base what I, what I talk about on facts, and um, some of the companies that I work for are all facts driven. So, Let's, let's look at some facts. Uh, we have 
Every death is, is tragic, and it's a heart attack, COVID-19. Let's not forget about those, the 10-year-old in Dayton last week, um, with, with some emotional issues, being separated from his classmates and his friends that killed himself as a 10-year-old because of the results of this shutdown. Every death that's happened in this state um, is tragic, be it COVID-19 or the fallout from COVID-19, through mental illness, through suicide, through opioid uh, uh, overdoses which have increased. The, the national uh, uh, suicide hotlines are up 1,100 uh, percent in phone calls uh, for folks that have uh, mental distress because of being isolated either from a parent or a nephew or their their uh, significant other that lives not in their household that they, they uh, have been socially conditioned that they can't go see. Um, so we have, we have a, a, a varied uh, amount of factual information on, on that, but what is really um, stunning when you come down to uh, to facts is that Joanne started alluding to it, some of the data that we're not getting uh, from the state. Um, with what I do in some of my consulting work um, is I pull up these facts. So uh, the second week of April, um, The second week of April, Ohio tested on average about 23 to 2,500 um, tests for COVID-19. The positive, the positivity rate um, back then, first second week of April, was about 16% positive off of those 22 to 2,400 tests. Um, April 22nd, we were up to about 3,300 tests a day. The positivity rate dropped to 13.9%. May 1st, we're up to about 5,000 tests a day. So our testing's going up. The media on the news is saying, oh, we had 300 tests, 300 positive cases. Today we have 400, now we have 600, but our testing level's going up. But here's, here's the key number, this positivity percentage. So first week of April, we're at 16%. April 22nd, we're at 13.9%. May 1st, just last week, we're testing a little over 5,000 uh, COVID-19 uh, potential patients a day. Our percentage has dropped to 10.8 percent positivity rate, so we're, we're dropping. We're in Medina. Um, as of yesterday, uh, May 7th, right yesterday, the day before Thursday, the last time there were these numbers, we're up over 8,000 tests a day. Our positivity percentage was 7.6 percent. So we are dropping almost a third in, in less than a month. On our pot, which is great. Uh, they're probably going to say that's because we, we forced you guys to stay home for the last uh, eight weeks. We're not at home today. We weren't at home the last four weeks in Columbus. We're all, we've all been together. Um, the states that have not had the shutdown are seeing the same data trends as the states that are shut down. But let's get to the bigger picture um, the economy. Um, Pre March 1st, all you heard for the prior three years of this great Trump economy was our unemployment rate. Anybody have an idea what that was? Three and a half nationally. Ohio was 4.1. That's 230,000 unemployed people in Ohio on March 1st. 4.1 percent. Pretty good number. Best in best in history in Ohio, really. Uh, so we're at two, we're at 230,000 on March 1st unemployed. Today. Today, we're at 1,348,000 unemployed people on the books in Ohio. 1.35 million people. Our workforce is only 5.4 million. That's 24.9% of every working man and woman in the state is without a job right now. You know the last time we hit that number? 1933. It was called the Great Depression. 24, the exact same percentage number, 24.9%. Now, take into take in, take in consideration, I'm a self-employed guy, 
Luckily, I only lost 37% of my business. I didn't lose at all. But there's 210 self-employed people, whether it be uh, uh, carpenters or advertising people or small business owners that uh, run boutiques. 210, 210,000 of those people are also out of work. They don't qualify for the country. So they're not out of work. There's 240,000 hospitality workers, whether it be uh, one-time restaurant workers, one-time uh, cleaning people at hotels. They don't qualify for the money because they didn't make enough money or work enough hours. So you add those 430,000 in, we're at 33.8% unemployment in this state. One out of three eligible workers in this state don't have jobs. The worst part of it is because of the inefficiencies. And granted, nobody, nobody can be prepared for this, uh, this crisis. Um, only 700,000 of those almost 1.75 million are getting paid on unemployment right now for the last eight weeks. So these single moms that work in restaurants and have two or three kids at home have not seen a dime. That's, that's the real crisis we're facing. And we're small, all the, the small towns, the county, county government, local government, all these restaurants, they're carry out. What does that mean? No sales tax, no revenue. We saw the Logan County yes, uh, on Tuesday. Two people from their sheriff's department. That's 20% of their workforce. So, so what's going to happen is, is, is they're going to be affected, be it through public safety, lay off the big salaries. This governor has not taken a pay cut. This governor did not uh, forego his salary. This lieutenant governor did not forego his salary. Dr. Amy Acton did not forego her $230,000 salary. But 1.7 million Ohioans have because of what they put the pen to paper to do to destroy this economy. Then look at what happened uh, on Monday. Um, Ohio was in, a, in an alleged upswing in economy with a $200, $200 million surplus. Eight weeks later, we lose 4% of our state economy almost one billion dollars uh, in revenue the government has to cut three quarters of a billion dollars in revenue uh, the majority of that is going to affect our schools so what's that mean to you the homeowner the taxpayer guess what's coming in november we need some money the state is I just saw uh, Medina High School was cut $650 million or uh, $650,000 from the state. Wadley High School was cut $900,000 from the state. Where, where are these schools going to get this money? They're coming to you. You lost your business, you lost your job, but we're going to raise your taxes. Don't think so. It's going to happen. It's coming. It's coming. Um, the other thing uh, I'll close with, um, on a personal level, I have a high school senior, uh, Cloverleaf High School. There's 208,000 high school seniors in this state because of what happened here in this state. It's not happening in Oklahoma. It's not happening in Arkansas. It's not happening in uh, some of the, the western states. Those kids got to go to prom, those kids got to walk the stage, the grandparents got to watch them graduate. Not in Ohio. Uh, the, the stress and strain, I, I see it firsthand with, with my kid, uh, who is a smart kid, strong kid, just broke it down. I mean, she had to do her graduation and drive one part of the people to come watch this video. Um, Grandma's not coming. Your aunts and uncles are coming. So we have to get our economy going. We have to make these politicians accountable. We can't stand for this anymore. This restaurant over here that's going to be at 20 percent capacity, he's still not making money on the 21st. He's not. The margins are too tight. They're not making money to carry out their pay and their bills. So we have to get Ohio open. We have to hold this governor, governor accountable. We have to hold this lieutenant governor accountable. And we have to support 
We are all in this together. And we will all get through this together. The world is now at the start of the 2009 influenza pandemic. The world can now reap the benefits of investments over the last 
five years. The world is now at the start of the 2009 influenza pandemic. The world can now reap the benefits of investments over the last five years. We are all in this together. And we will all get through this together. In early 2009, Mexico was the epicenter of a mysterious outbreak. A severe respiratory illness was affecting young people, contrary to seasonal viruses that often attack the elderly. Health officials in Mexico and the United States were puzzled by a virus that combined elements of swine, avian, and human influenza. The president now declaring the H1N1 outbreak a national emergency. The White House says the president signed this proclamation last night. It will allow medical officials to bypass certain federal requirements. Some officials describe this move as being similar to a declaration ahead of a hurricane making landfall. But certainly with President Obama declaring the h one N1 flu epidemic, a national emergency over the weekend. State health officials say it now gives them quicker reaction time if there is a major virus outbreak in the island. And health officials here say it's just a matter of time before we do see a swine flu outbreak. But President Barack Obama has declared swine flu a national emergency. The move gives hospitals more leeway in where they treat patients. Some hospitals have opened drive throughs and drive up tent clinics to screen and treat swine flu patients. They hope to keep infectious people out of regular emergency rooms and away from other sick patients. On the basis of available evidence and these expert assessments of the evidence, the scientific criteria for an influenza pandemic have been met. I have therefore decided to raise the level of influenza pandemic alert from phase five to phase six. The world is now at the start of the 2009 influenza pandemic. The Centers for Disease Control says H1N1 has spread to 46 states. More than 1,000 Americans have died and more than 20,000 have been hospitalized. Experts say it will likely spread further. So much like a disaster declaration before a hurricane, the president today declared the swine flu a national emergency. The White House says it's not meant to scare anyone. It simply loosens some bureaucratic red tape to make it easier for hospitals to get what they need. The president now declaring the H1N1 outbreak a national emergency. The White House says the president signed this proclamation last night. It will allow medical officials to bypass certain federal requirements. President Barack Obama has declared swine flu a national emergency. The move gives hospitals more leeway in where they treat patients. Some hospitals have opened drive throughs and drive up tent clinics to screen and treat swine flu patients. They hope to keep infectious people out of regular emergency rooms and away from other sick patients. It also addresses a financial question for hospitals. They can get reimbursed for treating people at sites not typically approved. The change comes as the U.S. death toll from H1N1 swine flu is topped a thousand. Forty-six states of widespread flu activity. With President Obama declaring the H1N1 flu epidemic a national emergency over the weekend, state health officials say it now gives them quicker reaction time if there is a major virus outbreak in the island. And health officials here say it's just a matter of time before we do see a swine flu outbreak. But it might be a good thing we are lagging behind the mainland on this epidemic. KITV's Jill Coromoto joins us live to explain. Well, Gary, the state's epidemiologist today told me we're showing signs of a second wave of the swine flu, not nearly the outbreak being seen on the mainland. And with the limited doses of the H1N1 vaccine available, health officials are telling the public to be prepared and be patient.
What a scene it was this weekend as Americans tried to do the right thing. President Obama decided to declare the epidemic a national emergency of swine flu. And around the country, people... The World Health Organization has declared a swine flu pandemic as the disease continues to spread around the world. We are all in this together. And we will all get through this together. While cases in the U.S. have abated since the initial outbreaks months ago, globally, the number of known infections has climbed to close to 30,000, with more than 140 deaths. The Centers for Disease Control this past week quadrupled its estimated H1N1 flu virus death toll to roughly 3,900 between April and mid-October. For more on the outbreak, we are joined by Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Fauci, good evening to you. Good evening. Despite those numbers we just gave, this past week in this country, the reported number of cases of H1N1 were down. Should we be encouraged by that? Uh, I think it's really premature to get any encouragement for that. There was a little blip down in the, in the pattern of the, of the number of cases. But since flu is, is eminently unpredictable, I think it's really dangerous to make any assumptions as what's going to happen over the next few weeks or months. Today's numbers are about four times higher than what the CDC reported just six days ago. Oh, no. Our estimates, we believe, give us a better estimate of how much disease, hospitalization, and death there is. The government now believes roughly 8 million children have come down with the virus. In addition to the 540 who have died, 36,000 have been hospitalized. Among adults 18 to 64, there were an estimated 12 million cases, 53,000 hospitalizations, and almost 3,000 deaths. What we are seeing in 2009 is unprecedented. But the agency insists the outbreak hasn't actually worsened. Instead, the numbers now include cases that previously had been missed. We have underreporting of cases for several reasons. Not all patients who actually die from this are detected, meaning that they don't even realize the hospital has what they have. In some cases, they suspect it but can't confirm it because the right tests weren't done. Or third of all, because of the fact that uh, it just doesn't get into the system. Still, the, the president now declaring the H1N1 outbreak a national emergency. The White House says the president signed this proclamation last night. It will allow medical officials to bypass certain federal requirements. Some officials described this move as being similar to a declaration ahead of a hurricane making landfall but certainly with president obama declaring the h1n1 flu epidemic a national emergency over the weekend state health officials say it now gives them quicker reaction time if there is a major virus outbreak in the island and health officials here say it's just a matter of time before we do see a swine flu outbreak but president barack obama has declared swine flu a national emergency the move gives hospitals more leeway in where they treat patients. Some hospitals have opened drive-throughs and drive-up tent clinics to screen and treat swine flu patients. They hope to keep infectious people out of regular emergency rooms and away from other sick patients. On the basis of available evidence and these expert assessments of the evidence, the scientific criteria for an influenza pandemic have been met. I have therefore decided to raise the level of influenza pandemic alert from phase five to phase six. The world is now at the start of the 2009 influenza pandemic. The world is now at the start of the 2009 influenza pandemic. The world can now reap the benefits of investments over the last five years. The world 
can now reap the benefits of investments over the last five years. We are all in this together.